Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to, downloading, watching, and listening to the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take on various topics that happen to cross one's path when one goes on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff. So you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Oh, hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger, and uh, I am a user experience designer, and I coach and teach related to that. One, I'm actually playing around with the idea where you're like, hey, I'm a teaching artist. I'm like, hmm, am I a teaching designer? <laughs> oh, you very well may be a teaching designer. Teaching Title and coaching designer. exploration continues. <laughs> The cutie mark crusader is still crusading for his cutie mark. So, uh, so this is a show where two two visual storytellers talk about various topics that uh, we engage with in our own personal professional endeavors as designers, storytellers, cartoonists, and so on. And but every once in a while, we like to take a break and say, "Hey, you know what? Let's talk about what we're reading, watching, and playing," because that. Uh, it's it's both a way to remind us that we are not like our job is not all who we are. <laughs> There's more to us than what we do for a living, um, and uh, and also the stuff that we engage with in a spirit of play or relaxation or rest or diversion um, that feeds into the stuff that we make as well. It's a worthy topic not just to talk about like picks of the week, but it's a worthy topic to th just to consider what we what we're attracted to, what we consume. It's part of that, part of an ongoing sort of uh, what I like to call the, my engagement with my analytic eye. Why am I attracted to what I'm attracted to? You know, one of the things that I've got for this week was something that when I encountered it, I was like, this is just like the Mandalorian, which I really liked, but I like this way better than the Mandalorian. And I had to ask myself, why is that? Uh, what, what was it about this that made me find it so much more appealing? Um, so anything that you want to layer on top of that, Rob? Uh, let's see. That's, I, I think you really, you cover the theme really well of, of reading, watching, playing. This is a, it's a recurring type of episode we've been doing for a number of years. And we like to remind people why we do it because typically there's, there's a really obvious, um, you know, service topic focus, almost every, every episode, except these recurring reading, watching, playing ones. Yet they, they themselves have this overall arc of we are, we're learning from what we consume. And this is something we try to make uh, more explicit because it's happening even if it's, even if it's impl implicit. The things you consume are informing the vocabulary of, of all sorts of design choices and possibilities for, for your work. They're the things that are uh, inspiring you, maybe the reason why you wanted to get up and, and also make things similar, right? Um, you know, maybe you hearing certain kind of guitar work gets you into that <laughs> interest <laughs> pursuit or um yeah i mean comics cartoons is all that stuff the stories the feelings we have the types of characters and so once you once you picking it apart a little bit you there it's like a rich treasure trove that you can on purpose get extra out of when you're you know thinking about what you make yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Yes, this could be something that we experience and digest implicitly, but Rob and I really have a preference for being explicit about these things and, and unpacking them. At the 306 episodes now. All right, so uh, with that, I guess I'll just go ahead and hit the music to let us know that we are now in the first half of the show where we're going to talk about what we're reading, watching, and playing. Uh, Rob, do you want to go first? Yes, I will go first. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, a watching thing that that uh, caught me by surprise a little bit because I still have um, I have a Funimation streaming account and so I like to revisit that and whatnot. Um, it's a it's a you know like everything it's another one of those recurring uh, service fees and whatnot. But um, but I think it's only like sixty a year and uh, it's it's a treasure trove of a lot of different shows that I've already watched that I like, and it's convenient to ha have around and whatnot. But then there's this there's stuff that I'm very curious about, but just haven't gotten around to. Right. And it's uh, well, one piece is an example of that. I, I started to try to watch one piece and um, fell off of it a couple of different times. And I couldn't tell you why or how, but you know, you, I pulled up the app for Funimation to look at it. And for some reason, 
it had the, I don't know, like an ep- episode 54, I guess, highlighted. And that could have been savvy and on purpose because they're, they're, they're like, let's start in medias res and where there's something very interesting going on. And now you get to see these characters being who they are in an interesting situation where, and not, not, not to pick apart the beginning of One Piece, I haven't really fully engaged with it because it just, it didn't hook me. It wasn't for me. It wasn't like where I was at the time because it, it seemed to be setting up a, um, let's show the team get formed and, you know, let's look at the start of the story. And I just, I was like, eh, I want to see who they are. Not, not the, um, not the early building blocks. Right. And so it turns out like the Warship Island arc, I guess it's called. Um, I was thinking of it as uh, the Millennium Dragon arc uh, because there's this, you know, there's this, uh, this young character and they're a caretaker taker for this, this uh, elderly dragon. And, um, and so the, the crew of the, the crew of the good folk pirates or whatever are, um, they're trying to, they, they sort of get sucked into this other adventure. In theory, they they have a bigger goal. Um, there's a, this overall theme of like following your dream in one piece that I found pretty interesting. And, uh, and everyone has their own take on that following your dream. And they're kind of supporting each other in following their dreams, which is an interesting twist on like the Dragon Ball Z. Uh, let's, all help one one another become as strong as we can be, um, and it's similar where it's like, hey, you're aspirational. I want to, I want you to get to where you want to be. Similar but but different taken on it. And so I'm like, oh, it's hooking me. Is this very interesting? And so yeah, and and it's if you are, you know, I'm probably the, one of the last five people on the planet to not really see One Piece. But like, if you're, you know, the one of the other four people in that group. Uh, this is a great place to start because I'm I'm not going to do a bunch of spoilers, but like it gave me strong feelings about the characters and their themes and like what they care about and how they work together. And there's a bigger problem in the world. How do they face problems? It's, it's a nice little story that plays out over just eight episodes. Super satisfying. It wasn't one of those things where, um, okay, we've set up, a series of cliffhanging teasers and we only paid off on just maybe the two you're least curious about and well, got to tune in, stay, you know, stay on board for another, you know, hundred episodes or whatever. They didn't pull any of those shenanigans. So I was just pleased all over the place because it, um, yeah, it was bite-sized and very satisfying. And, um, I can see why people love these characters. Hmm. Yeah, I've I've been aware of One Piece for well over a decade, and I have never taken the time to dive in, partially because of the daunting size of the story. I know it goes on for a really long time. Um, mm-hmm. Also, I've been I've watched conversations between my friends talking about it and seeing how emotional they get about it. It almost looks like there, there'd be dragons in there. <laughs> maybe you're not you're ready. Maybe you're not ready for like the big feelings you're going to feel about this thing when you finally engage with it. So that's also kind of kept me at arm's length, but I know it's, it's connected with a lot of people. So I, it's, it, there has to be something there. Um, but it's nice to know there's at least one little pocket someplace that I can go to, 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 to get, get a taste of it. I have another comment because as you're, mm. you're describing, yeah. So what's funny is as I'm recommending this and you're talking about the, there be dragons issue, mm-hmm. um, just the first paragraph on the one piece wiki mentions that this, uh, war, the warship Island arc is the first arc of the series, not based on any content from the manga. So I probably just in just <laughs> totally essentially started a trash fire with anyone who is, <laughs> is super into the, like, you know, we were fine in this fandom without your commentary. And okay, l- well, l- let me let me let me the- let me let me let me drift the car <laughs> into the way of that trash fire. Uh, mm-hmm. Is you know what? There's these Transformers movies by Michael Bay, and I tried watching them. I really tried, and and it was it was almost it was almost like having fire ants on my body. I was like, turn it off, turn it off. You know, like that when I was watching it. Uh, <laughs> Yet, yet, I have talked with people who have become fa- fans of the Transformers franchise because they were introduced to it through those movies. Like, oh, I really was only kind of aware of it. Then I watched these movies, and then I went back and looked at the source material, and I fell in love with them. I'm like, oh, okay, well, then you know what? It served a purpose. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I don't like it personally. I don't watch it personally. But, like, if it, if it does that, then 
who am I to complain? You know? So. Isn't that funny? So I guess what happened is there was, uh, and this is okay. So th- food for thought on the mechan- mechanism of that. If you have a large story, having some way to get um, uh, an approachable starting point, a jargony way would say like a place to onboard new users, right? Yeah. Uh, that that's what happened to me with this. Where yeah, One Piece seemed unapproachably daunting. Where yeah, it's like I could never swallow that entire story. Um, I. I barely make time to, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit in the, in the second half. I choose not to, to make time for lots of the, these different kinds of events and something that clearly shows up with this price of like, hey, I'm your hobby now. Watch me. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I don't, can't, I don't, I'm not, I'm choosing not to afford that. As, and, and all of a sudden, here's this little story arc. How funny that it ended up being one of those things where it's like, well, that's funny. Anyway. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm tempted to go down a whole jag about that, but I think anybody who's familiar with our show is aware that we're not the types who are going to try to shame anybody for for onboarding in the wrong place, you know? Uh, welcome to the club is always the lead Good into point. our uh, mantra. I, I, I would say that uh, the Garlic Jr. saga in Dragon Ball Z is a similar thing, and mm. it's one of my favorites, favorite little story arcs, um, and it's it's uh, because Gohan, Goku's son, ends up dealing with the a very hard situation and it's the um but it's fun and silly and it's a great adventure and you see you know gohan learn a lot of stuff it's a satisfying piece of story hmm uh okay ready for one of mine yeah ready um let's go to my watching because i'm excited about it because i encountered it like just this last week and i got really really jazzed um so we're familiar with the Mandalorian. Everybody's been talking about the Mandalorian. And even if we haven't watched it, we're familiar with baby Yoda. It's something to do with a, with a Boba Fett and a baby Yoda. Right. Um, I finally got unhypnotized from that and I can watch other things now. (laughs) Baby Yoda is compelling. Baby Yoda is compelling. Uh, so have you heard of this television show from, I want to say it was 2014 and it's it from it's a Japanese uh, television live action television show called Samurai Cat. I have not. I thought it was an ironic ironic joke poster when you um, talked about it. And, oh my and gosh! Like, nope, it's real. Well, it, it, it this is what happened is I'm, I'm flipping through Amazon Prime streaming th- stuff, and then all of a sudden it says Samurai Cat. I'm like, what is this? Is this like some kind of like? You know, You're will it burn? Me. Won't it burn? YouTube video meme thing, you know. Uh, and then I and I and I read the description and I'm like, is this for real? Because if this is for real, I'm in. And then I started watching it. Like it's as good as it promises. Uh, so it, here, I'll just read the description for those who are not watching the video. A fearsome samurai finally meets his match when he's contracted to take out a crime boss's beloved cat. But dot dot dot, it's too cute to kill, so he keeps it instead. Hilarity and action ensue as cute. Taro attempts to evade the detectives or evade detectives and learn how to care for a kitty. So that is the premise. He is a Ronin, a masterless samurai who's getting like the story starts with him. He's like in this like apartment. He's behind on his rent. He's very hungry. Um, Landlord shows up. He's like, geez, you haven't paid your rent in two months. And hey, by the way, your wife and kid keep writing you letters. Are you ever going to answer them? And he takes the letters and he opens the drawer and he puts the letters in the drawer unopened. We see there's a whole bunch more in there. So something happened. This guy is adrift and we don't know why. And he's very unhappy. And there's like the world is reaching out to him, but he's not reaching back. And finally, he gets this job to go murder this cat because this this uh, crime boss is servant is afraid that the cat is bewitching him he thinks it's a demon cat and when he shows up to kill it he can't do it because the cat is just too darn cute so he takes it home and lies to his employer and says like oh yeah i killed it and here's its spirit it's in this pot don't open the pot for any reason or the spirit will come out right um and then and then the 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 rest of the story is is that the crime boss hires this like world-class detective to chase down who murdered my beloved cat and meanwhile this you know, uh, out of work samurai is trying to figure out how do I even take care of a cat? The cat's peeing on his blankets. What? Why'd you do that? You know, uh, he keeps having to hide the cat because his landlord doesn't want him to have pets. And so it's like, it's got this, this, uh, this, this comedy aspect to it, as well as a, uh, uh, a, a building suspense as like the, the crime boss and the detective are closing in on him kind of thing. 
Um, and it's it's about this samurai who's like really like closed off from the world, slowly opening up to it again through his affection for this cat, right? Because uh, like at one point he's like, well, I'm just gonna take this cat to a shrine and just dump it and just get rid of it. And then he puts it there and he starts walking away. The cat's crying after him. He's like, sorry, I gotta go. Goodbye, you know. And then like. He gets halfway home. He's like, I can't do it. He goes back for the cat. The cat's gone. Oh, no. Now what am I going to do? I can't find the cat. And then finally gets home. The cat's there. Oh, you know, it's like got that kind of thing going on. Oh, my it's, gosh. It's so cute and so fun and so silly. And I think the reason I like it even better than Mandalorian is it's got all that drama and emotional, you know, um, growth of, you know, hardened, you know, samurai traveling warrior character and cute little character. But it's just a little bit more silly and it's a little bit more, um, mm, I, would just, I would just call it a little bit more lighthearted, you know, <laughs> it's not quite as serious, but it has serious tones because he is being hunted, you know, but it's also, it's like, it's dealing with the mundane, the mundanity of, uh, having a cat cats pee on your stuff. You know, they make messes. They howl all the time when they're hungry, you know, they claw up your stuff. <laughs> So, and, and I, I admit my bias here. I, I happen to have a lot of affection for cats. I have a new kitten in my life that I'm learning to like train to not do bad things, you know? Uh, so I, I can identify with that a little bit, but I've also, I just, I've always had a, a preference for cats. So Samurai Cat is something hmm. I've been watching and really enjoying a lot. How fun. So there's, wait a minute. So Samurai Cat was in 2014. There's two seasons on Amazon. Interesting. I suppose that if you go back to the the probable source material, there's there's a variety of other. You know, it's um, Wolf and Cub, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, influential high adventure. Um, f- oh, what well, gosh, what would you call it? The qualities that are a little risque and you know a little bit of gore and a little bit of naughty or a little bit of little sexual hints here and there whatever it's like that's what that's in in the actual source material of uh, um wolf and cub right mm. and uh it was funny and i never finished the series i've I don't know, I've read a bunch of books of it but um i don't even know how the series ends but it's 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 full of this whole um the drama of a, of a samurai taking care of their, their child and, you know, and still, you know, doing their job, you know, working. Right. Right. Yeah. There's like, there's some really cool fight scenes. Like he's on his way home with cat food and he gets into an altercation with like a bully, you know, who's bullying some peasant, you know, and he's like, stop it. Don't, you know, you have to be honorable. Don't be a, don't be a jerk, you know, uh-huh. kind of thing. And, and by the way, I got to wrap this up quick. Cause my cat's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and so that's funny like the premise of like the, the 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 cute you know cute thing we care about they're they're at risk and the you know someone learning and whatnot that's it's like how do they apply their skills in new ways and adapt and and become not closed off anymore it's yeah that, it's interesting um yeah i i would guess also probably influenced by wolf and cub Probably, probably. And and I, if I were to like put my analytic eye on it and like say like only one weekend, what I think is what is so attractive to me about it is it's got that elevated romance of the uh, daily live or die scenario of living in feudal Japan, right? Being a, being a ronin without a master, trying to like make ends meet and having to fight to survive kind of thing, which is like feels very alien and detached from my daily existence. But it has all the domestic warmth of try to care for somebody who needs you kind of thing of this little creature who depends on you, you know? And, and the, the, um, anxiety that, uh, that comes with domestic care, right? So you got the, the, the heightened anxiety of the romantic, uh, endeavor romantic in terms of like, you know, like not kissing, but romance in terms of like heightened reality and mm-hmm. v- versus the anxiety of like the domestic, uh, day to day. Um, I, I, I am such a sucker for that juxtaposition. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, what's next on our list? Oh, let's see. I'm trying to think what are some, <laughs> it's too, it's too on the nose, but, uh, so there's save the cat writes a novel, something I've been mm. reading and, um, you know, are all cat, cat themed. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's, so there's a book series. Oh gosh, I'm trying to, I can't remember the name of the original author, but, um, but there's a guy who, who wrote, uh, 
uh, sort of a, a a pattern, an architecture, an approach to storytelling, but really aimed at at movies, movie scripts, right? And so yeah, and it's called Save it, the Cat. Yeah. yeah, and it's called Save the Cat. And so this is a uh, so this this is by Jessica Brody, who's a student of that whole approach, and also um, a prolific author, and has applied these techniques to you know writing her own works and teaching others to um, to explore these different patterns instead of you know taking something like um, like a Joseph Campbell um, you know arc of the the hero, the hero's journey and whatnot. It's it's a little more um, it's more specific, not fully recipied, right? Mm-hmm. Where there's there's lots of room and openness, but but at the same time, this approach is teaching about um, uh, the role of different stories, scenarios as general patterns. Like, uh, let's see, um, like a mystery novel or a, um, a superhero story, and and then just and it's interesting hearing things, especially the superhero story um, analysis that has uh, and because it, it, it really echoes a lot of stuff I've already read and studied, and and um, and experimented with, but yet um, with a, this a different lens. And it's so it doesn't feel it, it's this interesting balance of a bit of formula plus a bit of um, like thoughtful prompting. To say like essentially saying saying like story in a way is uh, it's a series of uh, questions and answers and jobs to accomplish by these different characters who are um, you know and especially the main character, but then mm-hmm. but then you know B story characters have you know their their role for the main character, but also making secondary points and whatnot to to sort of um, create an overall you know an, enough depth and feeling and whatnot to to create a very satisfying story and part of the part of the point is to say well by having this kind of pacing in general you're going to you your your story will not sort of slog and drag and um and meander so it's that's sort of the justification of the saying like at 20 percent, make sure you're you know and i'm forgetting the patterns and stuff but like um it just you know so that, that's what she does instead of at so many pages in your um screenplay it's it's less specific like you know it's not saying like oh page 10 page 35 right or yeah percent yeah because blake snyder wrote the original save the cat about screenplays and he actually in like the last third of the book describes a sort of like milestone system he creates for his scripts like by page 25 this happens in the story by page 75 this is happening in the story and he says like it's it's he's speaking broadly and generally but he's still saying that like I try to accomplish these story goals by these parts of the script. Um, and is that basically what she's kind of doing with this with, in terms of novel, but like more, maybe even more generally speaking? It's more flexible, but yes. Okay. Um, because it's not prescriptive as far as page count, which would then get mm-hmm. just a little extra prescriptive there. Um, yeah, yeah, especially because novels can be like of various sizes. Volume of story. It's like, well, if you're going to spend, uh, you know, whatever 400 pages versus 200 pages then you know you're going to land a different page but the relative percent and place in the story is and that she provides a lot of examples so there's a lot of spoilers actually in the book as far as about um exploring the patterns through examples of real work in the world Mm -hmm. and sort of analyzing the pacing and events of different plots right it's it's observing patterns that occur in genre fiction right um I, and I, I i've heard this too is like advice from writers is like if you're going to write in a certain genre read that genre so you know what like the the tropes and the general expectations and the patterns are if if not to uh follow them if if but to uh defy them in clever ways right know know what, what parameters you're working with and i'm thinking too like like I don't want anybody to be confused in, in you know us talking about something that like sounds a little bit more prescriptive than we tend to work with but like we just did an episode not long ago where I was talking about like mini comic uh, lesson plans and uh, a nonfiction and fiction mini comic um, l- lesson that I teach in my classes I we map out a seven page mini comic and I put the story beats on each page like okay page one is your introduction page two we learn something about some of the characters page three we introduce some conflict page four we characters react to the conflict conflict page five you know there's there's um 
I forget what I forget what all my prompts are. I'd have to pull up my lesson plan, but but like that those beats are laid out so that it just gives you the essence of of what direction the story should go. But you can defy or change or play within those parameters in any way you want, right? Um, that's what I got from Blake Snyder's book. Is that it was more like he's sort of like just mapping out sort of uh, not not um, hard and fast parameters that you must work within, but like general milestones to try to try to shoot for um, to help give you some sense of context of what you're doing. That, um, yeah, I mean, I think that resonates in a way. Like, sure, it is a lot like your mini comic um, lesson plan, but it's uh, scaled up, right? So, so there's a larger um, work product in, in this, in this case that, uh, um, and, in, and which has more jobs to do, right? So, um, I'm looking at the PDF that came with the audiobook, and it reminds me of, of how, um, so, so Jessica, Jessica associates t certain, uh, lessons that main characters need to learn. The story is the mechanism through which they learn those lessons. Right. And then typically, and there's sort of a, an association of common lessons to, for, for certain genres. Right. And uh, so things like um, for, forgiveness, love, acceptance, faith, fear, trust, survival, selflessness, responsibility, and redemption. And um, yeah. And, and so it feels like it's, um, useful building blocks because this is like one like your like your exercise. Uh, one of the really hard things in the creative process is the beginning, and then all the rest of it, right? Where <laughs> you know, <laughs> getting started and it's like, oh, I have my intention and I have my approach that I'm going about, and now I'm starting to execute and I'm filling in outlines or or detailed scenes and pages. But then, am I staying on track? Is this mm -hmm. Um, holding up to scrutiny of, of um, you know, someone who I, I want to enjoy this kind of, you know, enjoy this work in the end. And these general patterns can, uh, can help. And it's not like a 10 steps to easily, you know, bust out a story that makes a ton of money, right? It's, it, there's still plenty of hard work to do, <laughs> even yeah. appreciating the, the patterns. Right, right. Yeah. Um knowing the patterns is only like a clue it's by no means like a uh, a roadmap to perfect success every time right mm -hmm. okay uh what about oh, something well, i've been i've been reading um so i just finished reading a graphic novel recently and yeah we'll talk about this in the second half of the show like the challenges of of like finding time for like focused activity versus like audiobooks which i can just consume anywhere and everywhere um but i read this book called stargazing by jen wang have you heard of this i have actually yeah i think uh my 10 year old read that oh did she like it i think she did uh i i wound up liking this quite a bit i was surprised at how much i like this and jen wang is doing i mean jen wang is a master comic storyteller but like this book is just like such a perfect example of that um, where she does things that she does things visually that deliver so much context and emotion from the the worldview of a child it she really remembers what it feel, felt like to be a kid and so there's panels that she chooses where the kid just reacts to something and i'm like oh that's exactly what it felt like to be 11 years old that is that 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 moment feels like i remember that viscerally you know um, and it's about, it's, it's a story of just two friends and, um, it's, it's semi-autobiographical. Um, but these, this new kid comes to town and, uh, or it's a new, it's a new neighbor kid. And well, I can just read the description here. Moon is everything Christine isn't. She's confident, impulsive, artistic. And though they both grew up in the same Chinese American suburb, Moon is somehow unlike anyone Christine has ever known. But after Moon moves in next door, these unlikely friends are soon best friends, sharing their favorite music videos and painting their toenails when Christine's strict parents aren't around. Moon even tells Christine her deepest secret, that she has visions, sometimes, of celestial beings who speak to her from the stars, who reassure her that Earth isn't where she really belongs. And so it's an exploration of these two friends and, uh, and how... Uh, how one can become really close to somebody and then the moment more people come in, how that dynamic gets altered and how we sometimes don't step up to the challenge of the, the new context of more friends coming into the mix when we have a very best friend. 
um, and and finding out that things aren't always what they seem, that kind of thing. It's a very, like, when you break down what the story is saying, it's very simple, but it's the way she tells it that makes you remember, yes, this is what it felt like to be a child, and I can imagine that every 11-year-old, 12-year-old who reads this book would see themselves in this story regardless of who they are, uh, just because she so perfectly captures that 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 feeling of being 11 and 12 years old and what friendship felt like at that age. Um, and, and that sense of desperately trying to find yourself while also wanting to be um, congratulated for who you already are. Does that, does that make sense, Rob? Um, yeah, really does. Um, it's, it's really hard to be, uh, like, I guess, well, I mean, growing up is, is super hard work <laughs> and, and feeling a sense of self and then, uh, willing to, and it's like, what parts of yourself do you, um, do you, are you willing to adapt and grow? Because in a way that's a, that's such big, scary change because, you know, so if you allow this, this lesson in or that, it's like, well, are you still you or, or whatnot? I don't know if it's like that exactly that kind of question, but like, it's, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot to be scared of. And there's a lot to be like overly confident of too, where it's like, well, of course I can do that. I've, I decided I'm that way or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful book, uh, Stargazing by Jen Wang. Um, anybody who's interested in comics, uh, in, in, in really picking apart, like, like if you're interested in just like looking at what an example of really great comic storytelling is, if you have a young person in your life, I think it's also great for that. Um, uh, great for to give to a young reader to just the, the story itself is really lovely in that it's, it's really about like, it's that old story of don't judge a book by its cover, but with a new approach and new context. And I, I think that that is a kind of story that young people cannot get enough of, uh, mm. you know, whether they're asking for it or not. I think it's something they should be <laughs> presented with uh, as much as possible. Um, but anyway, uh, so I feel like we're coming up on break time. I mean, there's lots yeah, more we could so. talk about. Yeah, but. there's always more to talk about. But yeah, that's a, this is a... You know, speaking, this is our Save the Cat uh, midpoint, so. That's true. Actually, very much so, yes. We, we, we do actually structure the show in a uh, Google Doc every week where we put, like, the, we're going to give ourselves this much time for this, each of these parts, and we're always watching the clock while we're having this conversation as naturally as we can. Um, and I would submit that we work well with those constraints, you know? I don't think we're making something where it's like, I stop you mid-sentence, ah! We're at 30 minutes, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for not doing the whole Oscar music to play me off all the time. It, it, uh, I think it's confidence building. It's, uh, I feel good. Okay, good. Uh, so in about a minute and 30 seconds, we're going to come back with the second half of the show. We're going to talk a little bit more about like how we... How we engage with the stuff that we read, watch, and play, and how we find the time to do it, uh, what kind of context we uh, incorporate reading, watching, and playing into our lives. But before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. Those are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. It's a way for you to say, hey, I believe in Jersey and Rob, and I believe in what they do, and I want it to be more sustainable. Um, and so I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis. Um, you can you can you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. You can cancel any time. But these are five people who have been doing it on a regular basis. So first up, thank you, Tim F. It means a lot to us that you believe in us and what we do. And Sophie Lawson, thank you, Sophie. You can find Sophie on Twitter at Sophie Lawson Art. And Chris Watkins, thank you, Chris. It means a lot to us that you believe in us and what we do. And Jonathan Wardson, thank you, Jonathan. It's awesome of you to be here every month for us. And finally, Nate Marcel. You can find Nate on Twitter at Great Sea Monster. And you can join them all at Lean Into or Patreon.com slash Lean Into Art, where you'll find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. It's uh, those sort of me and Rob riffing live on a topic, finding a subject once a month. And those posts are hidden behind the, the wall at Patreon.com slash Lean Into Art. And those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place where only fellow leaners are hanging out. And uh, also it gets you access to secret channels on the art, Lean Into Art Discord, patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It really does mean a lot. Thank you. All right, let's play some more music to get us to the second half. 
of the show. There we go. So, yeah, I thought I was thinking about, you know, this I think is a bit of an evergreen topic. It's a recurring topic, but it's one that's worth investigating over and over again is like, how do you find the space and time for reading, watching and playing? Um, Not to dig up the that old corpse of uh you know you are not the work and you know like like applying yourself forcefully and working 17 hours a day is a sign of courage but but it is difficult when you're trying to manage side hustle main hustle family you know uh sort of self-care you know how, how do you fit that stuff in and how does that how, how, how does that change your relationship with the stuff that you read watch and play so uh what about you, Rob? How do you when do you read, watch, and play and how? Maybe even pick one of those channels. When and how? Um I think I I mean I really try to reserve, even if this is for better or for worse, even if it cuts a little bit into my sleep, if I make sure I don't go from uh working straight to bed. <laughs> so a, that's the reliable portion of of my day. If if there's a little bit of um um like a wind down time, it's anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours, depending. And uh, that's, that's when I, so that, I mean, that's the how that's overall pretty repeatable. The thing is what I do in there is, is mm, there's a decent likeliness I'm going to be sketching while I'm, I have something on in the background that is compatible with sketching um, or playing a game. That's pretty much the, the thing where so I I the One Piece um, story arc I I I um I got through and and really enjoyed. I was paying focused attention to that off and on while sketching. Mm. For instance, so I would have uh, and so how that look what that looks like typically is I'll have a um, my tablet in front of me where I'm um, sketching, but then the actual video would be on my phone. Oh wow! Really. Mm-hmm. Oh, I hadn't considered watching on my phone because that would really prevent me from being too visually distracted by the thing. Um, we had a conversation via text over the last couple of days about this movie called Chud, Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers, which we talked about on and off on the show over the years. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a movie that I haven't seen in ages. It's a movie that we both kind of wanted to revisit and like talk about on extra lean together, um, for for a lot of reasons. But we both found ourselves not watching it, and I think we both reported to each other the same sort of reasons why is that like I found myself whenever I, you know, I'm working at home. Maybe I've got like I've got three hours set aside to like get some drawing done. I could put it on in the background. Um, but I found myself not doing it because it's like, I, I think I want to like settle in and like experience it, you know, like, like really drink it in like, uh, once or twice a month, uh, depending on which movie is playing on Saturdays, there's this, this, uh, what is it like a B movie slash horror movie, uh, show called Sven Gulli that comes on, on me TV. And if it's, if it's the right monster movie, I'll sit in and, and it's like, I, I don't want to do anything else while this is on. I just want to like experience this, you know, it's like, Oh, it's the creature from the black lagoon. I will always make time to watch the creature from the black lagoon. Um, and then there's other stuff that I can just have going on in the background, but like if it's too visual, like visually interesting, or if I'm not super familiar with it, I'll find myself stopping what I'm doing and like watching it, you know? Um, like I have like YouTube playlists of like, oh, that looks like an interesting tutorial. That looks like an interesting like essay that um, I'll like put it all in this playlist to like put on the background when I'm drawing, but then I'll find out like, uh, for instance, um, what is that game design one? There's a game design channel that I listen to that I've talked about on the show before where like the, he like the gaming historian. Not gaming historian. It, this is actually like a game designer who's like like deconstructing game design. Like he'll like deconstruct like Castlevania level design and look at like oh. how uh, I could put it in the show notes. Uh, but but like he gets so interesting that I stop what I'm doing and I watch. You know, and it's like I I find that like there's like three kind of layers to it. Is like is it too interesting where it's really grabbing all of my attention, or is it something I really want to experience, or is it something I can have on in the background? And I'm not great at at navigating that. That's something I've always had a hard time navigating. So like if it's going to be in the background, it's usually something that I've watched a couple times before. So like I can sort of 
tune in and tune out. I'm, it's, it's interesting to me that you can put on something that you're interested in, that you haven't seen, and sketch at the same time. I find that difficult to do. Hmm. It's a very particular case um, where, uh, let's see. I wonder if it was, uh, gosh, what was it? So I was consuming, what was I watching on Netflix? And I ran into the the, the magic of the, uh, what it was, it's, it's called like, it's not subtitles, it's the descriptive, it's audio. Sub- oh, audio that's right, yeah. The narration one. Yeah. Where essentially you don't have, oh, right. I was, it was um, The Witcher. That's how I watched The Witcher is that I, I'd be sketching during it. And it was, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. And so that went so well, then I've done it a little bit more since. And, uh, but even, even with, um, you know, with, with shows that don't have that super rich narration. Um, but with that rich narration, it's, it is very much a radio drama at that point. Yeah. And uh, you, it's totally, it's, it's far more optional to, to, you know, actually I, I'm, I'm not even really tempted as far as, you know, there, there isn't like a distracting tension going on with that kind of thing. And yes, there is a little bit with something like, um, like big action, um, you, you know, it's, it's like, I mean, one piece is full of, you know, fantasy fighting and, lots of emotions and stuff like it's just you know big magical creatures and evidently tons of sailing um (laughs) which i didn't really know or expect i kind of make sense you know king of the pirates and all that but i I just didn't really i didn't know and you know it's like the movie says star wars but wow you're in space a lot okay fair enough (laughs) i I should have known that I, I as an aside i remember like this is back in like 2005 or 2006 someone in the neighborhood uh and i remember reading an article it was written on like i might not even been an article might have been like a blog post uh rather a forum post on like talkaboutcomics.com forum and it was like talking about how it, remember 2005 was a long time ago now uh how the american comics industry was still at that point largely considered to be a superhero industry like there wasn't like a whole lot of like graphic novels about all these different subjects that we talk about now and somebody was saying like gosh we need to take a cue from japan you know what the most popular comic in japan is right now it's about a rubber pilot or rubber pirate who sails the seven seas and i when i read the description i was like really <laughs> <laughs> i kind of need to check this out a rubber pirate <laughs> yeah uh but yes, it, it, there's a lot of sailing and there's a lot of stretching, supposedly. But I haven't read it yet, and I will. That's true. <laughs> a lot of problem solving related to stretching. So, um, which is, I mean, metaphorically very interesting, right? Stretching, learning, adapting, what have you. Um, it, uh, yeah, storytelling metaphors are awesome. Uh, let's see. So, how did I get to? So anyway, like I don't know how I I, I don't overly endorse it. I'm just saying it, it kind of works for me for some things. Sure, and it's not like no, yeah. Um, I would say the sketching was more toward. Um, uh, I've been doing some problem solving in the background with like what what's my current tool set for my tablet stuff because my iPad's getting a little bit um, long in the tooth, and for some reason, like for instance, when I'm drawing in Clip Studio Paint, it's not really performing that well. I don't know mm. why. It looks like I'm when I'm when I have a large paintbrush, it looks like I'm stamping it across the screen. And I'm like, wow, this feels pretty weird and old-fashioned. It may be the whole older iPad battery, you know, performance tuning stuff in the background, whatever. I don't know. Wow. But I've been trying to figure out, like, well, what apps are going to work for me and this and that. And it's like, well, I need to, you know, I want to do this drawing experiment or I've got, the, you know, these poster ideas. I, let me play, but be focused on and doing that thing. Uh, but it's not high stakes work, right? It, this is like things I'm trying to learn and, and like um, get my tools in order kind of thing and pra- playfully pr- practice. Um, so I don't know if that help, is part of it too, where the, the actual, the outcomes of the work are not as critical. Probably. Probably, yeah. Because usually when I'm drawing uh, with the television on or any screen on, it's usually because I, or I'm usually doing some kind of finished comic book work. Um, I'm not just I, just taking time to sketch. Um, yeah, come to think of it, 
I almost never sketch when I'm, when I'm watching TV. It's usually, if, if any drawing happens, it's because I'm trying to get some, <laughs> I'm trying to stay on top of deadlines, <laughs> um, which is like, you know, that's, that's the upside downside of, of uh, working in comics, right? So I don't know, I'll have to try, I guess I could try that and see what my results are because sketching is much more low risk than say like inking. So, um, Okay. But yeah, where, where does you where does your reading happen? Do you take time to actually like read like like paper books? Um cuz like the the thing I've been trying to specifically read more graphic novels lately for a lot of reasons. Um but but uh I'm finding it's like it's really challenging to like okay, even though ca- graphic novels are rel- you read them relatively fast, it's like I want to drink them in. I want to like really savor like what's happening with the art and really like experience it and uh you know finding like an extra two hours a week to to have some focused reading time is not the smoothest experience uh i found yeah and it's isn't that funny and it's because i think it it pays off in such i don't know life benefiting ways where Mm -hmm. It's, it's an, it's, it's you know, like any kind of fitness sort of, um, dedicated reading time, uh, dedicated, f- um, you know, physical fitness time, what have you, or mm, w- other practices like maybe meditation, right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that kind of thing where uh, making the time for them, if for some reason, if those things, it can feel so, um, so, uh, I guess so much friction and difficulty because they, they're not, they're really this, this pure attention taking um, endeavor where it's like, like, there's no, like, there's no industrious byproduct of it other than like, it's a worthy endeavor in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel that tension too, as far as fitting that, like I I wouldn't have a, I, I, in in a given week, I'm probably not going to succeed uh, in all three categories of fitness, meditation, um, reading and great sleep or whatever. Like there, yeah. those aren't all going to be, you know, green light, solid, well done at the same time. And I, I, I'm not happy about that. I don't, I'm not celebrating that. I'm not saying like, and that's great. I'm saying that's a puzzle and I continue to, to, um, explore it. Yeah. What do you do? Like, cause I do it's, try to make some time to, but like, I'll pull off one of those things. Like, yes, I'll make sure I take, like, if I, uh, if I make a project where I put something in my way that I ha- I need to do it for the project, like for instance, rereading, um, seven habits of highly effective people. I got that book off my shelf and, you know, first time in a bajillion years and, uh, read through it to help me with the article I wrote. Right. Yeah, that that's another thing uh, altogether as well is that. So I said I'm reading graphic novels for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons I read is for pleasure slash research. Right, those those two things in my life are very very intertwined. Right, oh, interesting. Um, great category. And yeah, uh, so like uh, some of the books that I'm reading right now. I do a lot of my my book reading via audiobooks because you can do other things. I can I can exercise while I listen to audiobooks. I can clean the kitchen, make dinner, take showers, do whatever. You know, you do any kind of physical thing while you're listening to an audiobook and, you know, especially when it's like a physical thing where you're really not, you know, it's, it's more of an automated thing like running, you know. Um but that said, when I'm in research mode, there I I have this issue issue is that the right word? I notice that I run into a situation where I start urgently capturing. So, oh. and <laughs> this is a, such a pain. I understand. I'm curious. Yeah, what, it, what does it yeah, look you, like for you? you? You know what I'm talking about because yeah, you've been there. <laughs> so, um, I won't go into any more details. Then there's a project I might be working on in the future that that may be digging into my fascination with mythology, which we talked about last week. And I remember a year ago reading this or listening to this great lecture series from the great courses called Heroes and Legends, 
um, what is the full title? The most, oh, come on, give me the whole title. The most influential characters of literature. And so it's actually like, it's it's borrow, it's it's digging into not only mythology, but also just like classic literature, like Jane Austen books, uh, Tolkien, Tolkien, Dickens, and so on, uh, Twain. And uh, so I pull up that book. I'm like, yeah, I remember really enjoying that book. And I thought there were some really great ideas in there. Um, maybe I should like revisit the book now. I could just let the lectures just wash over me, and when the stuff bubbles up that is interesting, grab it. You know, I'm on the treadmill, but that doesn't mean I can't have a notepad with me. And if something happens, you know, I can either bookmark it or I can write it down. Um, but all of a sudden, I caught myself doing this thing where I'm skipping chapters. Like, no, 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 it wasn't in that chapter. I think this chapter was better. Wait a minute, this chapter's talking about Robin Hood, and that's kind of the direction I wanted to, like, explore with this thing. I'm just going to go to the Robin Hood chapter. Yeah, he's not really going to where I wanted with the Robin Hood. I start skipping all over the place, and I'm no longer enjoying the experience anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's this whole, like, I feel like it's this 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 monkey mind grasping at whatever. Like, where is it? Where is it? I'm digging through the pile of clothes. Where's the thing I'm looking for? When... It, I know, and I know objectively, that if I just relax and let the thing wash over me, I'll th that stuff will reveal itself. Through and and I'll enjoy listening to a bunch of really great lectures on a subject. <laughs> you know, um, so I I find myself like when I get into that urgent capture mode where I'm like start like rifling, um, it, I I suck the fun out of my own experiences that way, um, so. I try, I try to remind myself, don't be too purposeful, right? To, you know, I'm, I'm doing a Transformers podcast and like there's an episode where like the Zen master says to Rodimus Prime, like one cannot think of victory without also considering its opposite, you know, and thinking of defeat distracts the mind from what must be done in order to win, you know, so expect nothing, <laughs> just show up and expect nothing. And Rodimus is like, what? How do you do that? You know, but like that's that means like enjoy the moment, right? So I try to remind myself to get into that headspace, but I'm not successful at it all the time because like sometimes I get like, well, but I've only got so much time. <laughs> I've got 25, 30 minutes on the treadmill. I, I got to accomplish this problem while I'm also exercising. No, you don't. Calm down. Calm down, Jersey. But <laughs> right there. Oh my gosh. So much that. I. <sighs> I get, I'm, I'm, uh, let's see, sometimes fortune does favor the prepared and I pick the right thing that's harmonious with another activity and I can combine those things and it works out fine. And other times mm -hmm. it's like, I'm really trying to learn something and I need to actively engage with it. And I really should have just set aside the time to stay focused on the one task and, and make that, um, just make my time only about that. I was trying to make supper while listening to the book Daring to Lead and it mm. was not productive. <laughs> because holy moly does that have that book have a lot of great interesting quotes and framings. One of those things where if you if you read or enjoy a work and you're like, "Oh my god, that's brilliant. Oh my god, that's brilliant." And so all of a sudden bookmark, bookmark. Um not just bookmark because then I'll look back at a pile of bookmarks and not know why. Well, bookmark um, uh, add a, in, in the Audible app, you can add a clip. So I, I go, I hit the clip, I hit record to speak my reaction. And I'm doing this like every two and a half to five minutes. <laughs> like, it's, yay, I'm collecting some bookmarks and they're useful and, and I, I'll, they won't be this mystery when I look back at them. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not getting supper done. Right. There's yeah. you know, I'm sure I have one piece of supper going, but it's like there's a bunch of components. So, you know, I should have just set aside the time. And uh, yeah, I so I, don't, I, I feel that word. But once in a while, it works fine. Right. So listening yeah. to some some books, even though they may be um, also nonfiction, uh, I, I don't need to have as many bookmarks and that kind of thing. And I can I can make dinner or do dishes and it's. It's really pleasant, actually. I feel like everything's every, I, both things work out fine. I enjoy the mm -hmm. story, and I got a thing done. I wish yeah. I knew how to make that work for for always. And I over apply it. I know I do that too much. Uh, same, same here. And I, I think another thing that I tend to forget when I get into that kind of urgency mode is that I can listen to it again. You know, if it's that good, I can listen to it again, like I'm doing with this this series of lectures right now. 
you know and it's like i i'm i reminded of something that a quote that was attributed to stephen king i can't remember if i read it as a direct quote from him but it was something along the lines of he doesn't keep a notebook of his story ideas he lets the ideas roll around and if it's a really good idea he's not going to forget it because it's too good to let go now i again I, I, I remember reading this someplace and seeing it being attributed to him. I don't know if he actually said it, but I like this idea of if it's that good, it'll stick, you know? And so it's like, yes, I capture, I'd make bookmarks and I capture that way too. I make screen grabs. I write it down. You know, I'll write down the, 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 the line of dialogue as best or the, the, the phrasing as best I can remember and then write where it came from. Um, but you're right. Same. Similarly, if I have, you know, well, Someplace in here, yeah, I've got like a, a big pile of sticky notes from things that I've been capturing over the last week, you know, and it's just a whole bunch of like little snippets of lines and maybe I won't even remember where they all go to. Or I've created another job for myself by having to sift through all of this, which depending on the project may be a good thing, may be a bad thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something I have a tumultuous relationship with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, and like anything, I so for me, I get into the trap situation of, hey, that tool worked one time. I'm going to do it again, and it's just you know, and, and, and I, I should do a little filtering. It's almost like a like maybe sort of a check in with my day of of, of of the things I want to read or consume or watch or whatnot, and and somehow maybe filter in and out and based uh, a little bit better, right? Because it's it's a little hodgepodge and and just whatever i don't know maybe that's the way it's always going to be but at least i don't that this is getting me thinking like is there some way i want to um but because uh, then there's some books i never come back to because of how they're they were for super incompatible with um multitasking which is i just feel stupid saying that but it's true uh the book super better by jane mcgonigal um mm. i was trying to listen to it when i was on a commute and it is too participatory and it's mm. like, okay, well, here's the task to try right now. Think, you know, and it's like, uh oh, I'm driving. I can't do this. Yeah. Anyway, so then I table it, and I never came. I never came back to it. So, anyway. Mm. Hmm. So yeah. So yeah. That that's another friction to navigate. That I think is worth noting is that there are some kinds of reading, watching, playing that is incompatible with multitasking. We're, we're in a privileged time in that because of podcasts, because of audiobooks, we can consume so much while we do other things. But there's some things that really demand our full attention and, and giving that time to the thing is always uh, an interesting puzzle to navigate. And I, I don't think that, the, I think the interesting thing is to just mark that it's interesting and that it's a challenge is not to suggest any kind of like, here's here's the solution to it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. So now, yeah, I, I think experiencing that friction is okay. Finding ways to navigate it, also okay. Different outcomes, also okay. <laughs> so, it, because, yeah, so it, it it's really, uh, it, I, it's something that I I totally plan on experimenting on. And it's, if anyone has like cool ideas or handy tools or approaches or like a, a, a rubric or some rules of thumb where they're like, yeah, if it does that, so like a classic for me is like, I'm not going to engage in writing words while I'm hearing words, right? Mm. That for me doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Another thing that Ann and I have been playing with is there is a um, tap house or tap room uh, north of where I live. It's in a town called Powell, Ohio. Um, and it's called Noctera Brewing Company. And the reason we like going there is because it's it's like set up to be kind of like it looks like when we would go vacationing in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. It's like it feels like like you're in Columbus, you're in a city, and all of a sudden it's like now I'm in the woods up north. Like just like drive you know 20, 20 minutes and we're there. Um, and we've made a a point out of like twice a month go to the library, check out a comic book and go to Noctera, have a beer, and just read a comic together. You know, we just sit together and just read. And, and we've done this, we've made a habit out of this to the point where the, the guys at Noctera, when we go there, are like, what are you reading today? You know, like they actually uh, are curious about these this, this weird old couple who comes in <laughs> to read comic books together at the bar. Um, but Reading dates sound brilliant. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's just some quiet time. We don't even we don't really talk about the books, really. It's just more like just enjoying a cold beer in this lovely atmosphere 
and just getting lost in a book for a little while. So, and I found it, it's a well, nice I way mean, to create a, pur- a purposeful pause too. That's great. A life hacking. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so you know any given time you can find me at Noctera in lovely Powell Ohio all right um are we ready to do move on to two minute practice close out the are. show it was a, okay. it was a good uh it was a good reading watching playing a lot of I think... exploration of the purpose of it too mm. <laughs> well there's the music <laughs> all right fire it up for the last segment of the show. Troublemaker. <laughs> so, hi, Rob. Hey, Jersey. It's time to talk about our weekly check-in with the two-minute practice and mm-hmm. talk about what we have been practicing and what we intend to practice next. Uh, would you like to chime in on reflecting on what we did this last week? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. So, uh, last week, it was... Uh, you know, this is one of those things where we're sort of like, oh, what should we pick? And it's picking not to be prescriptive, but like here, here's a thing to consider. If you're into the idea of the two-minute practice, think about this one. Give it a try or, or make it your own or, or pick something different. It's just for a, a point of, of um, thinking about two-minute practice. But you actually picked two-minute meditation. Mm-hmm. And I thought, that's perfect. It was on my list as well. And I thought, well, why not? So let's let's give it a try. Did uh, did you try that? As well? I did. I did was not successful. I, I was not successful doing it every day, but you know it mm. was it, it was uh, there were there were days where it was more like I was going through my emergent task planner and then realizing oh that's t- I got to get this in there someplace and then when I would sit down to do it I wasn't really attending to it though in the spirit of that it's intended of like creating this purposeful pause in the day to stop and just practice and breathe. I was showing up with a sense of urgency and and sort of like anxiety, which, you know, then then I got into like this, like this discussion with myself. Well, that's the point of this is to like, you know, diminish anxiety, let it go, let it flow over you. No, I'm too anxious. So there are a couple of days where I just aborted. (laughs) It's like I hit, I pulled the eject cord. Um, but but the times I did do it and the times when I was able successfully able to talk myself into sitting down and I tried sitting in a chair, I tried sitting on the floor um, and it was it was it was oh gosh, how would I describe it? It was a lovely way to tease myself into wouldn't it be great if you could integrate this more into your life in a more meaningful way right It was like it's like getting that little tiny little paper cup of, you know, the sample in the store. It's like, would it be nice if we had this for dinner every night? Uh, It felt like that to me. How did it feel to you? What a great way to describe it. Because I I also was inconsistent. I think it was, I can't recall if it was four or five out of seven days where I did, I did make it happen. I had an inconsistent relationship with it as far as like, where did I try it? And like, um, so I, I, you know, I I did try sitting and different for postures two different times and I, I and on the, more on the floor or on a mat and then the other um just because I happen to have a mat set up right I mean for some reason or well not for some reason we we have a you know a few different um physical fitness things uh, that are pretty easily at hand at our house and um they get used by the whole family so I was like oh I'll sit here that's fine this mat is comfortable and and um so, so different seating situations uh, and like how I would start, but, uh, uh, every time I would just time myself with my, uh, voice assistant and, you know, had, didn't really put on any particular audio in the background. And then I just tried to breathe primarily. And I did, uh, I have a lot of, um, just a lot of things start to occur to me all of a sudden to-do lists and goals and other stuff. And I would try to say, okay, I, I understand that I'm reminded of like, okay, I've practiced meditation uh, consistently, but it's been a long time. And I was never, I would say I was a, I was a fine beginner <laughs> and I kept at it as a fine beginner for long enough where I'm like, I really appreciate that kind of pause and uh, the, the focus and acceptance, you know, the practicing of like stuff comes in my, to my mind and saying that, um, I can notice it and then I can let go of it. 
or I notice a lot of physical uh, phenomena too, where it's, it's like, uh, like I sat in the chair in my office and I would, this not to, so a lot of times I stand on a floor mat or I'll sit on this chair that can lower or raise or whatever. And all of a sudden, like, because I'm sitting in the chair, um, I could, it's weird. My sense of smell went through the roof or whatever. All of a sudden, like I smelled the mat and it's not, it wasn't a gross smell, but it was this plasticky smell. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm sitting here trying to breathe. And all I can think about is this plasticky smell. Mm. Okay. Stop thinking of it. And then it wouldn't go away. And then it wouldn't, you know, so then after a few days of that and saying like, oh, isn't this quirky? And, and, you know, just, isn't that just like meditation? It felt very much like the tiny sample situation where like, okay, this is one of those things where I, there's a tension with just the idea of two minute practice, because in a way, isn't it just sort of like a commercial for an awesome life? <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, what can of worms have I opened up? Just by doing, oh. I've made it approachable to become really attached to a whole sorts of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, doesn't that also point to, there's got to be some points where we can look forward to getting the sample cup and like Jim Gaffigan going, nah, you know, and tossing it aside, you know. I, I anticipate that there will be ones like that as well. But yes, this one felt very much to me. And I think it's because we both, I think at, at different points in our lives, we're very good beginners at this. Like I, I did it uh, for upwards of a half hour to 45 minutes a day for like over a year at one point in my life, you know? Um, and to the point where I had like really weird physical experiences where I felt like really like a sense of like, I'm like rooted to the ground. I'm feeling like the sense of like expansiveness and all that stuff that people talk about, like to the point where it frightened me. Like I felt like I was so... I was able to let go so much that I was like, is there, who's me anymore? And like, when I said that question, I was like, ah, back out, run away. <laughs> and, and I just stopped. I stopped doing it altogether. I remember writing a letter to my wife when we were dating about this. I'm like, I think I'm going to give it up. I, I, I'm too nervous. But, um, but uh, so it's like, it's a thing I have like a lot of affection for, a lot of like warmth toward. And it's something I'd like to integrate more into my life on a regular basis. Um, and I think that that, that, that contributed to the, the sample cup thing uh, sample cup oh that sounds like something at the doctor's office uh you know the little paper cup <laughs> with, with free samples I heard, yeah okay yes <laughs> whatever you choose to do with your two-minute practice you you know that's your intention so <laughs> so it makes you curious if we're going to find any anti-lessons too um, but well, honestly, but, I think I might be stumbled to like my first anti lesson is like, I, I know I've got a big list of practices I want to do or, or whatnot. And it's, it's, uh, I mean, in the theory behind it is, is that let's see how much more is possible in a, um, but not in like this, this, um, it's weird because it's this juxtaposition of, of, of patience and acceptance mixed with um ambition in a way mm. mm -hmm. i think that that's 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 pointing out an interesting like like uh trifecta of dynamics that we're trying to go for here right is and i think that that, that describes a lot of the character of the lean into art project as a whole is we're trying to be more accepting but we're also trying to keep an eye on being ambitious but we're also trying to be patient while being determined Patient, determined, and accepting. Mm. I like that mix. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sold. That that sounds like a worthwhile, difficult thing to to um, experience. So that's the, that's the meta practice of the two minute practice, right? Hmm. Nice. <laughs> I yeah. I, any other thoughts on the, on your two minute practice? No, I just very very similar to your experience. Um, a continuing challenge for me is right now as we record this i'm in a point of my career where i'm really learning a whole new kind of time management as i navigate having sort of a day job again um that is not drawing right um but is related to comics so finding how to fit everything in in a way where i'm hitting all of my daily benchmarks and still fitting in self-care and still fitting in explorations like the two minute practice 
is proving to be um, two minutes is is inexpensive. We keep saying that. Where to put it so that I can attend to it in a way that feels like I'm giving it my full self and I'm not just doing it in a perfunctory or performative way, mm. right? Uh, and I think I think part of the reason it made it harder to check into was there was less of an accountability in that there was nothing to capture except the experience to bring to the two minute practice recording, right? Um, whereas like anything when I'm doing like a drawing on a sticky note or something, there's something I could potentially share there. Um, I, I, I honestly had the conversation with myself where I was saying like, do I want to shoot a two minute video of me meditating? <laughs> you know, like who's gonna watch it? Who? who? <laughs> uh, I actually, what's funny? I didn't think of that this time. I what's I also didn't write. It's the the self care versus the creative two minute practices, right? I mean, those are yeah. maybe two functional uh, groupings. That um, yeah, when I'm doing the self care ones, I don't really want to perform on video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, but uh, I don't mind it if I'm actually making something. Yeah, same here. So what do we want to do this week? Let's see. So I guess we sort of did a experiential one, self-care-ish one. I don't know. Like, and I guess I, you know, the week, the week before that I did an, I did one of those as well. The, uh, the two minutes uh, workout one. So maybe, hmm. Ooh. This is a hard one. I, I'm, I'm looking at the list of ideas that I generated. So what do you think about, um, let's just do a writing one, write mm. for two minutes. Okay. It, funny you should say that. Uh, having recently been reading Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, one of the things she advocates for is write uh, longhand writing on paper, which I almost never do for creative writing. Uh, and so I just happened to grab a composition book and it is blank and I'm like, and I've been, it's been sitting on my desk waiting for me to actually attend to like doing some writing warm ups, just like do, you know, free form writing of whatever comes to mind. Uh, I think you've given me the opportunity to give that a try in a very inexpensive and, uh, uh, low risk way. Perfect. Two minute practice. <laughs> right for two minutes. There we go. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. So uh, I'm realizing now as we record this that I forgot to, to do our last ad break, and I will do it now before we close out the show. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so we're going we're gonna to wrap up with maybe a few last final thoughts and notes. But before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make the show possible. Uh, we make lots of things. And then we bring the thoughts that we engage with as we make the things to develop this project called Lean Into Art. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet, Mining for Trouble, a 92-page graphic novel that you can purchase at books.jdros.com. Full color all ages. It's it's specifically meant for younger people, but I think older, uh, especially there's a lot of like sort of uh, jokes about working freelance in here. So I think a lot of freelance cartoonists and designers would get a kick out of it as well. Uh, it's animal. What, how did C.S. Lewis put it? Clothed animals is the genre. And so it's adventuring animals who are best friends who go into the world and try to make a living as, as freelance adventurers and uh, getting into all sorts of trouble in a lighthearted way, uh, sort of, uh, you heard me talking about uh, Samurai Cat. That's kind of the vibe that I like, and that's what Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble has. You can find it at books.jdros.com. You can get a, a PDF ebook version, or you can get a printed book, um, and you can get one for a young person in your life. Rob, you do coaching. I do, and uh, and I do some teaching as well. And I wanted mm. to point out the workshops that I do at Skillshare.com. Mm. So if you go to, uh, let's see, I think the there should be a short URL for this, but the long URL, if just if just go to Skillshare.com, you can search for Rob Stenzinger, or you could do Skillshare.com slash r slash user slash Rob Stenzinger. Hey, URL is fun. But uh, <laughs> that would lead you to uh, four workshops that if you sign up for Skillshare, then you get access to them and everything else on their platform. And if you, I think if you use that link, it, it's like two free months to introduce you to the service. So 
Um, because Skillshare is kind of like a, you know, sort of a independent Netflix of learning and stuff. You know, that's not their ad copy. That's my reaction and uh, <laughs> using stuff I experience in day-to-day -day life to compare, what have you. But uh, yeah, I've got four workshops out there so far. More are coming. So I've got drawing user journey maps for collaboration. And that's um, that's just a really useful one to uh, to help you with, you know, you're, you're putting... Um, you're putting a lot of hats on and thinking through stuff in the, you know, from the perspective of your user, but then, you know, drawing out um, uh, other things too, of like, well, thinking about your, um, I, you know, maybe there's, uh, let's see, the touch points and the things that they're seeing on your site and like what, uh, what kind of problems are they facing or, or our compliments are you hearing? And so you got this journey and the ups and downs of the journey. And then you've got maybe um, your goals, your business goals, like where do they, how do they fit along that journey and, and all that stuff. That's uh, and it's, there's a bunch of techniques as far as um, interviewing and getting your ideas out for yourself and even your team members too. And uh, that's, that's a workshop at Skillshare sketching the happiest kitties out there customizing your next creative challenges out there and also goal setting using design plus, plus storytelling it's things that we've talked about over the last year. Um, all four of those workshops are at Skillshare. Um, and customizing your next creative challenge is if for anybody who's ever listened to the show and gotten excited about when I talk about like hacking my Inktober experience to like generate product development, um, do, uh, you know, product research or, um, you know, generate a bunch of material that could become like a, a minimum viable product. That's something that you'll get out of that workshop, customizing your next creative challenge is taking the parameters of the creative challenge where it's, you know, shipping something on a regular basis over the course of a discrete period of time and, up, and applying your own goals to it. So instead of just, you know, uh, running parallel to everybody else doing the creative challenge, you're sort of creating your own sort of nested creative challenge in there, which can be a great way to generate a lot of interesting work in a short amount of time so yeah thank you it's uh yeah that's that, that is an approach there's some useful worksheets and of course little lessons all these things are they're less than an hour each right so it's in and they're they're little but little bite-sized um portions of learning experience and you know different you know depending on the workshop you'll see some uh some examples of other work that i share there and maybe bonus material and, and things like that it's um they're all helpful in their own in their own way to um, to help you um, you know and from anything from UX to some some uh, design storytelling and uh, goals maybe covering a variety of topics. Cool. So that's at robstenzinger.com is where you can get to the Skillshare site. Um, or look for Rob Stenzinger on Skillshare. And the last thing we hope you'll check out today is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, Lean Into Art has a forum where you can sign on and there's three public channels where you can show up and comment and discuss past show topics, suggest new so show topics, share some of your challenges and quests like the two minute practice. And then there's three channels that are only for people who support us on Patreon, including a social channel where you can just post about what's going on in your life. And uh, Rob and I hang out there as well as a bunch of really awesome people that we call the leaners. There is a link or a uh, invite link in the show notes. Okay. So any last thoughts on this whole uh, reading, watching, playing for this time before we head out? Uh, let's see. I wouldn't, I, I'm always curious to hear what, uh, what the leaners are experiencing with, uh, with both the sort of like the, the, the tuning of your, of your time to, uh, you know, it's not like uh, things keep, I mean, stories, it's not like, um, I did. I didn't get get around to One Piece for forever. I mean, that's mm -hmm. it's been around for well over a decade. Uh, it still was great and fresh when when I checked it out. So it's like, it is, uh, but then the Mandalorian. It's like, well, I don't know. That one feel it felt really zeitgeisty, and I thought, well, I it have did. the chance, and maybe this could work. And it did. It was fun. It's and that that's kind of a rare yeah. thing. So I'm just curious. It's like, where do you, where do you go for timeless versus zeitgeist versus? Um, productive and parallel versus totally focused mm, and, that's great that's a good prompt and yeah take, bring it to the discord we'd love to talk about it with you there perfect i think i think we did a podcast rob i agree all right so okay uh 
Casey <laughs> caught me off guard with that one. Um, we record the show weekly, usually on Thursdays, sometimes on Wednesdays, and we stream it live at twitch.tv slash leanatuart, and we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanatuart and leanatuart.com. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanatuart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanatuart.com as well. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.